All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Scissor Tail Podcast. Episode 16 now, as Will would say if he were here today, we're driving, at least with some restrictions. And uh, you might be able to notice, if you haven't seen on the Twitter sphere, we've been highly promoting McNelly's Midtown, McNelly's Oklahoma City now, and you can hear in the background the great throes of people here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon enjoying burgers, beers, all kinds of great food and drink. And we want to say thank you to them for being our host and our signature sponsor of the Scissor Tail Podcast. Today I'll be doing my best Colin Coward impression as my co-host Will Bowersox is unavailable. He missed both of our indoor soccer game today, which was a rousing 11-9 to victory, as well as this recording session today. So he's sorely missed, I'm sure. The episode will be shorter without him and lacking some great technical acumen, but we'll try to do our best. All right, so let's dive into it. We've talked about our sponsors. Let me tell you where you can hear us, find us, on Twitter, at ScissorTailPod. Uh, you can e- email us on at gmail.com. We're on SoundCloud, we're on iTunes, and we definitely want to once again say thank you to McNelly's. Please come out. Uh, enjoy the environment, get a beer, get a burger, and we will continue to be here on Sunday afternoons recording live. We invite everyone to come out. We will eventually have guests, players, people from the team. So come out, talk to them, have a burger, and hang out with us. The Scissor Tail Podcast. So, corrections from last week. I don't think we have any. At least I don't have any in my notes. Results from last week. As we all know, a home game, a 2-1 to one loss against the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, the hated rival Fort Lauderdale Strikers, in front of a crowd of approximately 3,700 at Miller Stadium in beautiful Yukon, Oklahoma. Uh, that attendance number is something I'll talk a little bit more about later on in the episode as we continue to track that. Things we liked, things we didn't like about the game. The, something I liked about the game, as the stats show, as we'll talk about later, Ryo OKC continued to dominate the offensive side of the ball and the defensive side of the ball, dominating possession, uh, over 100 more passes than our opponent, but leading me to the, seems like they're truly lacking that offense in the final third of the field. Uh, you know, with, with players like Billy Forbes and Giorgio Samaras, you really expect those players to be able to finish football. And we've seen that everywhere on the field except for the final third. So uh, he spoke a little bit about it in the post-game press conference. Uh, we asked him a few questions about that. So we've got that audio ready. We're going to go ahead and drop that in now. And after the audio from the post-game press conference, you'll hear... Potentially some congas, potentially a sponsor, an ad or two, and we'll be back to do a little bit of tech talk. Stay with us. Coach, just uh, obviously you haven't picked up a win this year at home. How much is that frustrating the players? Is it forcing indecisions? Is it forcing any anything on the play on the field? No, I mean um, there were moments that. You know, did a lot of good things. Um, you know, there's then there was other moments we, you know, we were really flat in some areas and kind of a little bit up and down, which I didn't like. You know, there were, like I said, there were moments that felt like, hey, we're dominating the game, we're starting to create chances, and all of a sudden we go flat. Don't know where that came from. Um, you know, I, I expect more from my guys. You know, we had a game plan in place, and you know, we do a lot of research. And, uh, and there's no no takeaway from Fort Lauderdale. Um, we showed our guys what they're gonna do. And it was it was exactly that. Get it wide, serve balls in, make sure you track runners because they've got guys that, that can finish. You know, and they score the first one on exactly that. You know, so that's that's sometimes a it's a hard pill to swallow just because you you know you've prepared the guys yet. Ultimately, they've got to go on the field and execute. And uh, it was a bit unfortunate. Again, no no takeaway from Fort Lauderdale. F- fantastic finish, but it should have never happened. 
you know, we were we were prepared for what they wanted to throw at us. Um, you know, I have to watch that free kick. It, it did look like a nice free kick, but I've got to I've got to watch it and analyze it a little bit better to see if it was a, uh, you know, something that could have maybe been fixed. Coach, the stats really support what you just said. You guys really dominated the game. Fifty six percent overall possession for Rio. Over a hundred more successful passes than Fort Lauderdale. Uh, they did outshoot you sixteen to nine, and it seemed like that flatness occurred in the final third of the field yep. for Rio. So, can you speak on that a little bit more and why you're so dominant in the game, but still seemingly not being able to finish those chances at home at yeah. least? Yeah, I mean, we we've got a. I think I've said this a few times already, and we got to be more clinical with our opportunities. And um, you know, it's again sometimes it's tough to swallow because put guys in positions and have a game plan in place to to set them up for success. Yet sometimes, you know, you know some individuals need to step up, and that that is a fact, right? Yes, we have some injuries. I'm a coach. I will never make excuses. You know, you have to do with what you have, and. Uh, you know, I'm confident in all my players, but certain individuals in the attack have to pick it up. You know, we got to score goals too. Um, and if you don't put away chances, we can't say, hey, we don't have Robbie or this or that. Hey, guys got to step up and, and get the job done too. Um, our fans deserve wins here. Um, again, I thought we did enough. Today I don't think was our best game, but we did enough to still get the three points. Um, but if you're not finishing your chances... You know, anything can happen, like a, a free kick goal. You know, like I said, it, it may have been a fantastic goal. I got to watch it again to see if you know we could have done something differently. But um, if you don't finish, anything can happen like that, and uh, that's that's soccer. So you you kind of just alluded to it, but we saw a fresh face tonight. Ian Svontessen made his first appearance. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there any specific reason for your decision to substitute him on, just to try to get a spark, or well, it was, something you saw in training? Yeah, you know, it's um, Fort Lauderdale were playing in the mid block, and they, they they gave us space in behind. Yet we never exposed that space, and that's a little bit frustrating because we we had the discussion of sometimes you've got to stretch them, sometimes you've got to make runs in behind just to open and make them think, make them become defenders. Um, when you start making these runs in behind, defenders now start dropping back. It creates more space in front of them uh, for our guys like Bailey Sebastian to have more space on the ball to run at players. But we had no runs in behind, and they were giving us that space to do those runs. Um, and Ian is one of those guys that, yeah, he's a blue-collar, hard-working kid. He got his pro debut tonight. He almost had one. Keeper made a big save on him. I'm um, actually very, very pleased with his performance. He he fought on the field. You know, the nicest guy on our team started a little a little rumble, but that shows he's passionate. Shows that he wants it, and that's the players I want. You know, you step on that field and you put on that Rye OKC jersey, you better leave it all on the line. You know, um, yeah, <laughs> you leave it all on the line if you're going to play for me. You know, I can accept losing. That's part of the game. I wish we could win every game, but uh, you've got to pour it all out there. You've got to be able to execute, and you know there's individual accountability. And certain guys got to got to step it up because we depend on all players here. How about Sebastian? Have you heard anything about his injury? We we heard it was pretty bad. You know, maybe uh, I know we had a PK prior to that. I would argue that was probably a PK. You know, but I think just because we had a PK prior, maybe has ref a little hesitant. Again, I have to watch it to to confirm that statement. You know, I could be wrong. You know, and. It, when you're watching during the game, you're very passionate, so you can make a mistake. But uh, it looked like a pretty hard foul, and I mean, he he's in the emergency room, so it, it is something pretty serious. And I, I don't think uh, he'd be in the emergency room if it wasn't, you know, a knock. But um, hopefully, he's all right. He's a key player, and you know, our challenge this year, facts back that up. We haven't had our preferred starting eleven yet this year, due to injuries. In a small roster. I mean, this is these are facts. I'm not going to hide away from facts. I'm not making excuses. Just stating facts. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's tough. You know, we've done a lot of good things, but sometimes that final quality is not there. 
if he's out, who are you going to look to try to replace him with? Or is there just a bit yeah, of it's every week we're, we're we're switching and rotating, and it's due to necessity, not necessarily, hey, this is what's best, and or this is preferred. This is, you know, what we, we got to do. You know, we got to go out there and give it our all. You know, we've had players play out of position. Richard Manjavar played number nine. I don't think he's ever played number nine in his life before. Uh, he's done a fantastic job, but, you know, you've got to roll with the punches, make the most of it, you know, and uh, like I said, we are missing a little bit, uh, a little bit of quality uh, in the attack because I think we could, uh, if we had a little bit more of that, I think we'd be in a different situation we are now. Um, there's a lot of bright things, though. That's why I'm very, very encouraged, you know, maybe a few moves here and there. Um, we could be among the leaders in the league. I feel strongly about that, you know. Um, but right now, we, you know, we're winless at home. Nothing I like. Never experienced this before so far, but we're, I, I can guarantee you we're going to get it right and we're going to turn it around. From a coaching perspective, do you try to change things during training in the week to do? I mean, no, to no. Our, our game plan every week has been spot on, you know, and um, like I said, we, we're missing a little bit of quality. In that in that final third, uh, and we've got to work off the field to to find that, um, and then hopefully certain players step up and you know play to the level we know that they're they're capable of. Uh, that does fall on individuals. Um, our job is to motivate and prepare, and their jobs to execute. And uh, like I said, a lot of bright things though. We're not not panicked by any means. You know, every game, you know, I'll be the first one to admit if there's a game that says, hey, they were the better team or, well, I mean, I feel pretty good. Not happy with the result, but there were a lot of positives. And uh, like I said, if we were a little more clinical, a little more hungry, you know, a little more cutthroat with our movement in the final third, I do feel we could have had the result. Uh, but we weren't. So no excuses. Hats off to Fort Lauderdale. Congrats on their well-deserved three points. Two more questions, guys. Um... I know, obviously, you have a game on the road against New York coming up, but chances are we won't be able to talk to you again before the U.S. Open Cup game coming up a week from Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask, for that game, do you plan on treating that game any differently than a league game in terms of lineup, roster, preparation, anything like that? No. I mean, that's a, it's an important game. Like, every game we step on the pitch is important. Um, you know, uh, the energy is a, a very good organization and club and team. Um, and we have nothing but the utmost respect for, for their ability and what they can do on the field. And we're going to prepare the same as any, any ESL team. And we're going to go out there and, and give it our best. And uh, hopefully we get the result. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, guys. podcast and you know what that sound means all of that synthesized beautiful synth for tech talk so once again uh, flying solo like Jason Derulo this week Will can't join me so you'll have to put up with my more amateur technical observations uh, team came out in a 4-3-3 again this week really more of a true 4-3-3 than we've seen in the past. Numerous returns to the lineup uh, joined in the starting lineup. We saw Sebastian Velasquez back in the starting lineup, which was good to see. It was great to see um, until later in the game. Um, so a true 4-3-3. Samaras is really supposed to be playing that central forward position. It's very clear through his average position. He likes to drift wide. According to the off the jack average positioning, he found himself out on the right more than anything, but we've seen him drift to the left and switch positions with uh, players on the wings. But especially in this league, in this style of play, uh, I think that Allen really wants Georgios to be that big target man up top, and he's got to be able to receive in balls and distribute those passes as well as get on the end of uh, get on the end of the aerial crosses and, and hopefully put some headers on frame. So, uh, other lineup notes. Uh, we got to see Ian Fontessen for the first time in his professional career. He came on for Georgios uh, pretty early on. Uh, 
uh, looks like that was um, about the 54th minute. And George S. was really, really close game press conference from Coach Marcina. Some of the players on this team that are supposed to be better offensively, supposed to be better performing offensively than they have. And I think uh, it's no surprise to see that, that substitution, which was hopeful to bring a spark into the offense. Uh, for the second half, being down 1-0, and it really did. Um, Ian had a, a, at least one opportunity, which was a great header, like Alan said in, in the post-game press conference. Uh, and that offensive attack led to the penalty call that Michelle slotted into the back of the net. So scoring quite a few penalties, but goals are goals. Um, unfortunately, uh, Fort Lauderdale did, did counter come back down, um, earned a penalty, or excuse me, earned, earned a foul in what shouldn't have been a very dangerous position, but Nunez with the gun better, that's easy for us to say, not being in that position, but clear that he took kind of a drop step, any sort of fingertips on the ball in the upper 90 corner. So, yeah, very, very disappointing to again see how much this team, Rio being being this team, of course, dominated the game. 402 total passes to 303 for Fort Lauderdale. Only 12% of their passes were long, so they're playing a really ticky-tacky, ticky-tacky style of offense. 84% passing accuracy. Uh, the crosses were very, very similar, 18 to 19. Uh, possessions, 56% for Rio. And then when you look at the attack, uh, 17 to 13 shots in the favor of Fort Lauderdale. So, but that 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 stat was a little bit skewed closer to Fort Lauderdale's favor earlier in the game. And I think the kind of uh, the dumping of of the offense at the end of the game, especially with Danny Danny Fernandez coming up into the opposing team's 18 to try to try to equalize late. The Ryan Johnson substitute late. Um, and then, of course, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the forced substitution of Tyler Gibson coming on because of a, an injury, a very serious injury to Sebastian Velasquez that saw him leave the field on a stretcher, go into an ambulance, and go to the hospital. So... Uh, very interesting. We need to keep an eye on that, definitely. So let's let's cover some other injury updates. As I said, Sebastian left the game. Uh, we did hear late last night that he did go in for x-rays, and the x-rays were negative. So we expect that he'll have an MRI today and be looked at, and we'll hopefully have some news. You know, Don't expect to see him in the Cosmos game this weekend. Maybe it was just precautionary. Uh, we might see him back in the U.S. Open Cup game. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't really count on it with the way that he left the game. Uh, Marvin Chavez and Pekka both were in training on Thursday. They weren't training with the team, but they were working uh, with Adam, with the physio. And I would be really surprised if we didn't see both of them playing, starting, or, or at least on the bench Saturday in New York. Uh, another name that has been talked about, wondering where he was, Eric Norales. I know Franco Soyuan tweeted that they were looking to part ways with him, but there was never any closure on that. So uh, at training last week, I did ask, what's the deal with Eric? He's not here. And the deal with Eric was kind of a funny one, I guess. Um, Eric came to the team with the intention of signing a contract, but when the league as a whole came to Rio OKC and said, are you going to use an international slot on Eric Norales? The team said, no, we're not going to. He is only going to be signed. He's only going to sign a contract, an official contract, be an official member of the roster if he gets his green card and does not use an international slot. Well, that never happened, but somehow the NASL went ahead and put him on the roster anyways. So then flash forward to a couple weeks ago, the league comes back and says, hey, are you guys going to cut Eric Morales? And the team kind of went to the league and said, he was never officially on our team. He was just training with us as a trialist until he could get his green card or move on. So bottom line is he's officially not with the team anymore. 
Uh, and the last player to mention in terms of injury updates, Robbie Finley. Uh, didn't see him last night. He wasn't in training when we were there. Um, and we have from a good source that Robbie will at least be out for the rest of the spring season. So pretty serious injury for him. And uh, we'll have to keep you keep everybody up to date on that. But don't be surprised if Robbie's gone until at least July. So. All right. We, with that, we are going to take another break. Uh, hopefully that has fulfilled your desire for tech, tech talk. And when we come back, we will preview the truly hated New York Cosmos. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. We're done talking about the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. We've moved on. Can't win at home, but the good news is we've got a road game coming up. Playing the hated New York Cosmos. Cuck the Fosmos. It's the, uh, the standard line when anybody asks about the New York Cosmos, except a little bit less dyslexia. Uh, the Cosmos are hated because their fans are elitists. And they're also hated because they consistently have a top team with lots of money, lots of good players, even though they play at a crap stadium. That's not even really in, it's in Long Island, I guess, right? Hofstra. Anyways, Saturday at the New York Cosmos, 6th Central. Uh, I believe it's going to be on One World Sports. All the Cosmos games are on One World Sports. Cox locally, of course. The Cosmos this year, um, the same as every other year. They're going to compete for championships. Players to watch for on the Cosmos, Juan Arango, Nico Kronjar, Jake Arietta. Just a few of the names that I'm sure we'll see Saturday involved in key build-up play, key link-up play, and be really interesting to see how this Ryo KC team does on the road, especially with the health issues that they've had, uh, players being out for injury. So hopefully we'll see everybody back Saturday except for, as we mentioned, Robbie and Saba. And um, we'll see if we can continue the road winning streak, or at least the road point streak that they've got going right now. Uh, other than that, I don't really have anything for the Cosmos game. We're gonna should be a should be a bigger preview than that, but as I said, without my co-host Will here to talk about how much he knows about other NASL teams, combined with the fact that next week's episode is gonna be quite long, we're gonna have a lot to talk about between the Cosmos recap and previewing two games next week. The first being the huge U.S. Open Cup game to be played at Miller Stadium on June first. So. We'll end our preview of the Cosmos right now. And if I had to pick a prediction for the game Saturday, at this point in time, not knowing 11, not knowing health, I would still pick a 3-2 to two Ryo OKC victory Saturday at Hofstra in New York. So stay tuned. We'll be back for Free Talk. All right, welcome back. Free Talk segment now, episode 16. We're driving. We're doing Free Talk. We want to, once again, thank McNellie's for having us out, for being our host sponsor. Uh, do want do have a couple of notes here to tell you about goings-on here at McNellie's. Every week at McNellie's Midtown, they offer a Beer Geek special. This is a specialty beer that is offered at a discounted price. Special offer runs for one week, Monday through Sunday, and it rotates weekly, obviously. So for this week, starting tomorrow, Monday, uh, the Beer Geek Special is the Stillwater Autumnal Farmhouse Ale for $6. Also, every Monday night, there's Pint Night here at Pinelli's. Pint Night starts at 5 o'clock, so come in for a happy hour uh, right after work. You buy a pint of the special beer for pint night every Monday, and you keep the glass for that beer. So this Monday, tomorrow, as of recording Sunday, so hopefully by the time we get this edited and out, it will be also tomorrow or possibly day of. Uh, it's going to be Goose Island Green Line Pale Ale. So come come out, have a pint of Goose Island Green Line Pale Ale. 
and keep your glass. The monthly beer special for the month of May is the Founders Day, excuse me, Founders All Day IPA for $3. So some great things to check out here at McNelly's. Once again, thanks to them for having us out. also want to say thanks to Peter and Brad from Rio's Red Army. They're here. You can hear them clinking, drinking, uh, watching, currently watching the Portland-Vancouver matchup right now. So, yeah, you could be like them. You could be just as cool as these guys if you came out. we got a nice big table here. Come have a beer, hang out. We'll talk in between segments. You guys can grade me on how good we're doing, but something we plan to be doing here for a long time. So, all right, let's talk about free talk. Let's talk free talk. Fort Lauderdale Strikers. We just played them at home, beer at home, but they're about to get a new home, apparently. Uh, They're going to move out of their ancient and aging stadium there in Fort Lauderdale, which I'm not entirely sure where it is or what it's about. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Maybe we won't because they're going to move into the cricket grounds in Fort Lauderdale and South Florida, the Broward County cricket grounds or something along those lines. So the big talk this week was, how's that going to work? Cricket grounds, if you know, are a circle. And these particular cricket grounds have large covered stands that run about a semicircle. So no matter how well you try to fit a rectangle in a circle, you're always going to have some people that are still pretty far away from the action. But in terms of grounds and building and everything, it's supposed to be a really nice upgrade. So we'll, we'll be interested to see how that goes on. And, and I guess the rumor was the, the strikers may be moving there as early as the fall season this year. So Ryo might be playing in the cricket grounds this fall. Uh, one other point that I had on here for free talk I was listening to my good friends and total NASL counterpart, Teo Gautier, who covers the Ottawa Fury, but he also has the NASL nightcap that they do every Wednesday night, I believe, they record. Episode number 14 for the NASL Nightcap. If you haven't listened to it, I highly suggest you go check it out. It should be required listening for all NASL fans. Um, He interviews John Tannenwald, I believe was his name, uh, from Philly.com, a writer for Philly.com. He covers soccer for them. And he provided a very interesting, what I would call, quote, unquote, other side of the coin in terms of the expansion race and why some teams might decide to self-relegate or expansion teams or teams moving up from semi-professional leagues would choose the USL over the NASL. It has a lot to do with the involvement of traffic sports in the NASL. They are still an equity partner in the league. And uh, if you may, you may or may not know, have been in some legal trouble with FIFA. They were part of the whole group that FIFA took down, uh, you know, a few months ago. So I'm not going to try to speak about it too much, but I'm just saying you should go listen to it. And really, hopefully, will make you wonder, is this one reason why teams are choosing the USL over the NASL to expand into, you know, coupled with the lower expansion fee and, and the history of the league? So... Uh, just certainly something to to listen to if you're an NASL fan. Kind of going along with that, uh, some big news in Nashville this week as the USL announced they have been working with Nashville FC ownership to try to bring the USL team to Nashville. Very interesting because also the NASL has not been shy about trying to put a, a team in Nashville. So will Nashville become the new ground zero for soccer wars? Will, will the... Will the gaze of, of the soccer world, or at least the United States, shift from Oklahoma City, which so far we are all of the opinion that Oklahoma City can support two teams in two different leagues. Will that gaze shift to Nashville? Will we see a USL team in Nashville? It's still drama-filled, and it's something that everybody should check out as well. Keep an eye on Nashville. Uh, all right, we'll have more expansion talk in the coming weeks. We've been working on a little behind-the-scenes stuff on expansion and timelines, and we've got a nice spreadsheet drawn up of all the potential potential cities and potential leagues and potential teams coming up. So that's pretty much going to wrap it up for Episode 16. Hope you enjoyed my Colin Coward impression. Hope you enjoyed just listening to my sweet voice 
for this entire episode. When we come back next week, we'll talk about hopefully a victory over the Cosmos and build up to a U.S. Open Cup game and uh, some more NASL action to finish out the spring season. Thanks for joining me. Once again, you can check us out, Scissor Podcast, at Scissor Pod on Twitter, Scissor Pod at gmail.com, SoundCloud, iTunes. This is Porter Cunningham, and I've enjoyed having you with me today. Till next time.